So during sport, our muscular system responds in five main ways. We've got an increased blood supply, an increase in muscle temperature, we've got an increase in lactate, we've got an increase in pliability and micro tears. So we'll start off with an increase in blood supply. When we start to exercise, energy demands in the muscle go up because obviously we need to resynthesize ATP to ensure that muscular contractions can continue in accordance with the demands of the sport or the, or the activity that we're doing. In order to do that efficiently, uh, our body wants to get as, as much oxygen to the muscle cell as possible so that, we, so that we can enter aerobic pathways as soon as possible. Receptors around the body detect these, these demands that the muscles are making by different chemical changes that occur and they relay this message up to the brain, which then makes changes to the cardiovascular system, such as cardiac output, breathing rates, etc. And we can start to get more blood flowing around the body per minute, arriving at the muscles to deliver more oxygen. A second response, which can also increase blood supply, is the, the, the blood redistribution that happens, or the vascular shunt mechanism, where we have vasodilation occurring inside blood vessels, especially in those which are supplying the muscles which are in demand of extra oxygen. It's not only oxygen, though. We've got increase in CO2 and increasing lactic acid levels, and all of these signals are being detected, which are, are telling the brain, signaling our brain, to increase blood supply to the working muscle. So vasodilation, that works by the blood, the, oh, by the blood vessel expanding, so the smooth muscle around the, those vessel walls increase in size, it allows more blood to pass through, and the precapillary sphincters, which then sort of divide up the artery to the arterioles to the capillaries, those precapillary sphincters, they start to relax or dilate, so that more blood can start to flow through them to the working muscle. So an increased blood supply is achieved. Second, we have an increase in muscle temperature. Now this is caused by cellular metabolism as well as uh, the, the transfer of energy from movement into heat. Cellular metabolism is when we break down food or food sources or fuel sources, fuel sources, sorry, uh, such as phosphocreatine, glycogen, free fatty acids. We break these down inside our cells to produce energy which we can use to resynthesize ATP. A byproduct of all of that, however, is heat. And as we have increasing demand inside of our muscles for ATP production, we have to start producing more, which leads to a greater production of heat as a byproduct. This, or these larger quantities of heat being produced by our cells, dissipate into the surrounding tissue, thus bringing up the temperature of the muscle. So we've got cellular metabolism, we've also got friction. As muscle fibres inside the muscle start to slide over each other, um, think sliding filament theory if you've covered that, these fibres slide over each other to shorten the muscle to make it contract or to coil up and to pull bones around. That sliding action causes friction between the, the two surfaces of those muscle fibres. With friction, again, comes this heat transfer of, or sorry, the energy transfer of heat. So as the fibres slide over each other, that movement energy transfers into heat energy, which again dissipates into surrounding tissue. Not only have we got fibres sliding over each other, but we've also got joint movement happening as well. So take, for example, the knee or the, the shoulder, the elbow. As those structures are moving, we've got articular cartilage rubbing against each other. We've got bursas, we've got synovial fluid, we've got the ligaments starting to move around. All of this movement that's occurring, you know, there, there has to be some sort of transfer of, of energy. So that movement, if there's any sort of movement against each other, two surfaces rubbing against each other, that leads to friction, which leads or transfers into heat energy, which again dissipates into surrounding tissue. So we've got an increase in blood supply, we've got an increase in temperature, we've also got an increase in pliability. Now pliability is it's not it's not quite flexibility, it's more it's more efficient muscular action in an increasing range of movement. So it becomes more elastic as the temperature goes up because the fibers become a little more a little bit more stretchy. But we've also got the, the, the relationship between the, the neuro or the neuro system or the neurological system and the muscular system. As we begin to exercise, neurotransmissions are being sent more frequently and at higher magnitudes. As we continue to exercise, the muscles which are working become far more responsive to, to neurotransmissions. So the fibers which are working, they begin to be far more responsive or more alert or more susceptible to, to working as soon as the neurotransmission arrives. A second impact of, of exercise is that any sort of stretch reflex that was, occur or that was present at rest begins to get reduced. So a stretch reflex is when a muscle experiences tension 
and a transmission is sent back to that same muscle which is experiencing stretch to tell it to, to coil back up, to, to go back into the safe zone. As we start to exercise, we can begin to stretch this muscle further and further through its range of movement without our nervous system kicking in with that safety contraction or that safety mechanism. So when we, well, as soon as we start to exercise, the stretch reflex begins to become less and less in play. So we've got increased responsiveness of the neuromuscular transmissions and junctions, and we've got the reduction of stretch reflex. So increased blood supply, increased muscle temperature, increased pliability. Next we have is an increase in lactate. Now I've, all, I've already touched on that uh, slightly in increased blood supply, but if exercise intensity is high or in the initial stages of exercise, we can't utilize oxygen to enter aerobic energy pathways. So we can't completely break down glycogen or free fatty acids to generate lots of ATP uh, with, with one molecule. Instead, we have to use the partial breakdown of glycogen or anaerobic processes. Now, not so much for phosphocreatine because that's a very clean energy system, but for the partial breakdown of glycogen, where we go glycogen to glucose to pyruvic acid, we then have to convert it into lactic acid because we can't take it further into the cell because we haven't got sufficient oxygen supply. High intensity exercise demands rapid supply and resynthesis of ATP. The partial breakdown of glycogen through anaerobic glycolysis is the only way that we can do that. So in order to satisfy energy demands which our muscles are making to us, we have to use the inefficient and the lactic acid producing energy system as a result. So because we can't break it down completely, glycogen is converted into lactic acid when we release energy for the ATP resynthesis. And if we have to continually do this, gradually that lactic acid is going to build up inside of our muscles and the surrounding tissue and in our blood. And eventually it's going to get to a tipping point where the acidity that's being generated by this lactic acid production is too much for our muscles to continue working at the rate they currently are. So muscle contractions or muscle contractility begins to drop or reduce, thus reducing the energy demands. This increases the surplus of oxygen available and we can then start to break down that lactic acid and we can continue into the aerobic pathways. But that lactic acid production is also known as the onset of blood lactate accumulation, so OBLA. We've got that lactic acid being generated because we can't cope, well, we can't cope with the, the energy demands using the aerobic pathways. Lastly then, we have micro tears. Now, micro tears occur you know, on a microscopic level. Obviously, if we've got a big tear, which we can see, you know, like a, a strain or a sprain, uh, if we're dealing with you know, these, these macro injuries, but micro tears are, you know, they're microscopic. And they, they tend to occur in the muscle fibrils, not the muscle fiber. Think of a muscle fibril as the base unit of a muscle. It's a strand or a string of proteins attached to each other end to end. And then if we were to collect a bundle of muscle fibrils together, that's what we would then call a muscle fiber. Now, if we're exercising at high intensity, it's likely we're gonna be placing force or tension on these fibrils, which they're not normally used to. And just like an elastic band, if we place too much tension into a fibril at any one time, it's gonna snap. Now, it's okay if one or two fibrils within a muscle fiber snap. It's just, you know, what, what that would look like on the outside would just be a little bit of a tear, which is what we call the micro tears. So if a muscle fibril snaps within side of a muscle fiber, we call it a micro tear. That's, well, that tends to be the, the intention of high intensity exercise because this moves into more adaptions rather than responses now, but because of that micro tear, with sufficient rest, with sufficient recovery and sufficient nutrition, think protein, we can start to repair those micro tears and we don't just put it back together, we actually either add to it or build a new one so that we can cope with the tension that broke it in the future. Okay, so those micro tears can lead to muscular hypertrophy. So that's our five responses to exercises in the muscular system. Increased blood supply, increase temperature, increased pliability, increased lactate, and the, well, the creation or production of micro tears in the muscle. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you again next time.